What's up, comic book fans? And welcome to Comics Icons. Now, JJ, what they call me. And today, we got more from the ashes. This time with the Uncanny X-Men issue number one. And if you've missed any of the other From the Ashes issues, then I'll put a link at the top of your screen and a card at the end of the video as well. But we finally get the long-awaited Gail Simone series featuring an X-Men group led by the one and only Rogue. Now, as you all know, after the end of the Krakoan era, the mutants all ended up going their separate ways. We saw in X-Men number one that Cyclops was heading up his own team in Alaska and Jean Grey is out in the cosmos doing Phoenix type things. Plus Forge has a team and Laura Kinney's got a team. Plus there's still more to come. But the uncanny X-Men is set to hold things down in Louisiana. And I know there's plenty of you guys that are pretty hyped up for this series, especially since the release of this issue shot straight to the top of the bestseller list by more than doubling the sales of Batman issue 151. So if you guys are ready for the latest edition of From the Ashes and you want to see how Rogue becomes the leader to this new team, then you guys know what time it is. Let's get it. So we picked this story up in Westchester County, New York at the former Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. And we meet a woman named Dr. Ellis. And when the doctor and crew enter the school, they marvel at how much the so-called criminals as she refers to the X-Men lived better than real people. But she instructs her century team of soldiers to tear down every piece of wood and brass from the place. And as they walk the halls, she also has them burn all of the personal items left behind. She wants the art stripped and put aside for appraisal and everything. She wants to turn this place into a prison, which if you got a chance to check out this year's free comic book day issue, we actually saw the school being converted. But she then notifies the Sentry Captain, Captain Ezra, to start calling her Warden instead of Doctor from here on out. But then Dr. Ellis has her assistant, Philip, take her to see what she's really interested in. Cerebro. But as they stroll through Cerebro, she scoffs at the arrogance of an invention like this before she requests Captain Ezra to burn it down. And when the Captain questions how they'll do all of this covertly, she lets him know that she doesn't really care to be covert. She feels like her cause is just, and there's no reason to hide what she's doing here. Let the world see. Let their kind see, she tells the captain. Public hangings if necessary. Put it on streaming. Y'all, this chick is ruthless. <laughs> she seems like she's going to be a real problem out here for these mutants. But she wants the Cerebro portion of the property completely removed. But then Captain Ezra notifies her of a call that he's receiving, that the first prisoner has just arrived, which pleases the doctor. And then she welcomes this new inmate, which I'm assuming is Professor X, but we'll officially find out later, I'm sure. What do you guys think it is, though? But then we transition over to Mexico City 24 hours ago as Logan visits an old guy named Miguel as he's on his deathbed. And when he walks into Miguel's room, he's handed an old bottle that Miguel tells Logan now belongs to him. But Logan initially tries to refuse the bottle. And I'm guessing that this bottle is a part of a bet or something for whoever lives longer. Because Logan responds that he doesn't want it because he cheated. He actually had died. But then he came back. And news of this intrigues Miguel, as he's curious as to what Logan saw when he died. What comes after, he asks. Where am I going? But unfortunately, all Logan can remember from it is nothing but darkness. But he admits that sometimes he does miss the quiet of it. But then we see him later on just outside of Mexico City as he meets up with Rogue and Gambit at the Pyramid of the Sun and Avenue of the Dead. But it has apparently been some time since they've seen each other because Rogue is super excited to see him. But then we get a full shot of the Pyramid that they meet up at and see that sleeping at the top of it is Sauron, the God Snake, who begins to awaken when he's approached by these three. And he's not at all happy about being disturbed and immediately threatens to eat them. So now the two guys look to Rogue as the leader and asks if she has a plan. 
But Rogue's just wondering how she became the leader here. <laughs> but then when Sadaran starts to mesmerize Rogue, we find out from Logan that there are actually two eyes of Agamotto. The one that we're familiar with, worn by Doctor Strange. But then there's a second one that belongs to Sadaran, who winds up knocking Rogue through the pyramid. But she does manage to bounce back and give the God Snake a vicious uppercut, dropping him momentarily, giving Logan the time to jump on him and try to cut out the eye of Agamotto. But Sadaran then uses the eye to blast Logan off of him. And then Gambit, the super thief, he wants to crack and get in the eye, so he tries to get Rogue to hold him still, which Rogue admits is easier said than done. But she and Logan manage to blind the giant snake god, allowing Gambit to charge up a couple of cards and then explode them right in Sadarong's face. But this isn't enough to stop Sadarong, who only gets angrier after being blinded, and he readies himself to attack once again just before Gambit offers him to make a trade and reveals that he's taken the eye right off of the snake's belly and then threatens to explode it if the snake makes another move. But the deal that Gambit makes with him is that he goes to Antarctica to sleep instead of here and he's to eat no one for a year. Then Gambit will return his artifact, which Sadarong agrees to. But before he leaves, he decides to tell the three of what he sees in their future. Something ruinous, he claims. And then he says the word endling. And then he tells them that two of them have already cheated death, but she will present them with the bill someday. But then he leaves and on his way out, he tells Gambit that he will return in one year to get back what he's owed. But then after he leaves, Logan pulls out that bottle that was given to him by Miguel and he gets ready to offer for the three of them to drink it. But Rogue then gets a call from Cyclops about a mission for them that he can't get around to at the moment. And then we pick up in Central Oregon with a young mutant on the run as she's being chased by a couple guys. And as they catch up to her and start attacking her, she's forced to defend herself and take these guys out. But there's a voice that speaks with her during this entire ordeal. And as she tries to plead with the voice that she just wants to live, the voice tells her that it's time to come to mommy as we see two long, pale, white arms with freakishly long nails reach out for her from the darkness of the forest. And then we're taken over to Mississippi at the University of Mississippi Medical Center as Logan, Rogue, and Gambit arrive, and Nightcrawler is there to meet them. And at first, Gambit thinks that they're here for some kind of make-a-wish for mutants. But Nightcrawler tells him that this is not as dire as that. The boy they're here to see is mostly stable for now, but he's a low-level precog and telepath. Harvey X is his name, and he's a huge fan, and all he wants in this world is to be one of the X-Men. But as the doctor gets ready to let them in to see the boy, she tells them of the tumor he has, but this will mean so much to him. And when they walk in, little Harvey just freaks out. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you came! The X-Men came! Then he tells them that they're his favorites and he knows absolutely everything about them. Logan, meanwhile, asks the doctor about not having any monitors hooked up. But the doctor tells him that Harvey's not in any danger right now, so they only have a pulse oximeter for him. But Logan disagrees and he tells the doctor she needs to hurry up and call Harvey's parents back. Rogue, meanwhile, sits down on Harvey's bed while all he can think about is how hot she is. <laughs> And Nightcrawler even gifts the kid with his very own X-Men jacket. But when Harvey touches Rogue's hand, she thinks to herself how cold it is. And Logan, meanwhile, instantly yells for the doctor to press the blue button because he can sense what's about to happen. And then the boy immediately begins to get a premonition as he goes into a seizure. And he tells Rogue that they're coming. You have to help them. And one of them is the Endling which Rogue remembers Sadarong mentioning as well. But the doctors then all run in and the X-Men are forced to wait outside. And after about 10 minutes, they already know the outcome because Wolverine already knows the outcome. As the doctor then comes out of the room with the absolute worst of news and Rogue just collapses. There's nothing worse than seeing a child go and you can just feel her pain in this moment. But afterwards, 
Rogue tells Gambit that she just needs to go find somewhere far right now where grief can't find her. So Gambit decides to drive them to Louisiana. And when they arrive at what looks to be an orphanage where I assume Gambit grew up at, the three are welcomed by a guy named Marcus, who tells the group to go rest by the fire pit and he'll bring them out a little something special. And then he brings them a local beer that Gambit is over the moon about, as it's hard to get a hold of it, he tells them. A rogue, meanwhile, is super somber right now, and rightfully so. But now she just keeps thinking about everything that they've lost and that they almost had Xavier's dream. But now it's just emptiness as she wonders if they're even still X-Men or will there even be an X-Men anymore? And if so, who would even lead them right now? But Gambit tells her that maybe they shouldn't be responsible for every weight in the world. Maybe they should just live for a while without fighting. And Logan agrees with Gambit. Plus, none of them are the ones to fill Xavier's chair, and why would they want to? But Rogue responds that it's because of little Harvey. They have to have been made this way for a reason. Before Xavier's school, she had nothing, and there has to be a purpose. But as she continues, Logan interrupts her because he hears or smells something out there. And it's got hooves, he tells them. And then out of the darkness, someone calls out for help. And then four mutants with a horse are revealed, telling the group that she's coming for us. Help us. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the issue. So what did you guys think about Gail Simone's new Uncanny X-Men first issue? Do you guys like the idea of Rogue leading a team? And who do you think that this mommy is that's after the mutants? I personally like this issue, and I think it might be a series to follow. Plus, I really like the addition of Dr. Ellis. I think she's going to be a real problem out here. And I wonder if she's got anything to do with whoever mommy is. What do you guys think? You know, I want to hear all your best thoughts and theories down in the comments about the issue and the possible future of this series. And as always, if you guys enjoyed this video and this channel and you'd like to support the channel, then you can do so by stopping by the Comics Icon store and picking up some Comics Icons merchandise including the background music heard right here in this video, available for download. Or by joining the Iconic Fan Club channel membership. And there will be a link in the description to join. But with your membership, your voice will be heard during our interactive live streams with yours truly, where we can talk about everything that's been going down in these issues, as well as ones that you'd like for me to go over in the future in other comic news. Plus, you guys will get loyalty badges, member shoutouts, and up to 20% off of Comics Icons merchandise from the Comics Icon store. Plus, we've got tiers to the memberships as well, beginning at just 99 cents. Or you guys can donate to the channel with a super thanks. And if you're not able to do any of that, then you can still help this channel's future out tremendously by dropping a like, share, and subscribing to Comics Icons for more icons in the comic book world. But ladies and gentlemen, it's about that time. I'm out.